If you've been alive for the last 10 years or so, you probably have heard of the very successful video game called The Last of Us, which was created by Naughty Dog Studios. It was probably their best video game ever due to its creative story, engaging gameplay, and interesting mechanics. A little do you know, they decided to make a live action adaptation based on it, which I recently watched. It was amazing and like many other adaptations in my opinion, but what made it look so good? And how were they able to make all these amazing environments, characters, and all different kinds of zombies and effects? And most importantly, what are the tools and techniques they implemented to create all this stuff? Creating the world of The Last of Us in Canada presented unexpected challenges in what became the country's most expensive production. The artistic hurdles were evident in the relatively pristine streets and buildings, and a surprising absence of gritty neighborhoods and the near total lack of massive rundown shipping yards. The envisioned post-apocalyptic environment of The Last of Us faced a significant obstacle, which is the locations simply did not convey the story of a world that has come to an end. And deterred, production designer John Pano tackled the challenge head-on by making a bold decision to build the post-apocalyptic world. A noteworthy accomplishment was the construction of a quarantine zone replicating downtown Boston, meticulously crafted from the ground up and transformed into an apocalyptic setting. The sheer scale of this production reportedly earned it the distinction of being the country's most expensive endeavor, I mean in this field, which shows the substantial resources invested in bringing the world of The Last of Us to life. Double Negative served as the primary VFX vendor for The Last of Us, closely adhering to the game's aesthetics. Impressed by the game's realistic concept art, the team aimed to maintain a heightened reality in the show while working with physical elements. They sought to surpass expectations by incorporating details like falling wallpaper, dirt, and a pervasive gray atmosphere, drawing from their experience, particularly from projects like Chernobyl. Craig emphasized the importance of portraying a thoroughly desolate and dilapidated environment. According to him, when things have ceased to function for two decades, especially in urban areas, one can only imagine the extent of decay with no electricity, water flooding everywhere, and an overall atmosphere of abandonment. Playing a pivotal role as one of the main VFX collaborators for the show, Double Negative employed a diverse array of techniques to vividly recreate the world of The Last of Us. This involved constructing skylines, demolishing buildings, and adopting iconic locations. Nick Marshall, the DFX supervisor at DNAG, emphasized the paramount importance of honoring the games and the exceptional craftsmanship demonstrated by Naughty Dog in shaping the world. He emphasized the need to attain a level of photorealism that would seamlessly integrate the visual effects into the overall narrative. And to do this, the team compiled an extensive reference library of real-world locations. This served as a crucial resource for making decisions about abandoned structures, communities, vehicles exposed to the elements, collapsed buildings, and the nuanced process of degradation under various conditions. Additionally, they undertook trips to the show's key locations, photographing reference areas that were then meticulously recreated as the photorealistic environment seen in the final production. Melina Mays, CG supervisor at DNAG, highlighted that their build department played a pivotal role by creating over 25 unique building assets specifically tailored for the Boston sequences. These assets were crafted to match the buildings from the locations shot in Alberta, incorporating elements of Boston architecture. The environment and effects teams conducted detailed destruction simulations for each building, enhancing the realism with additional debris. And to further elevate authenticity, the team added intricate set dressing elements like moving blinds and wires, and the environment's team contributed by designing procedural IV setups and vegetation scatters for each of the buildings, I mean hero buildings, in the meticulously crafted scenes. 
No corners were cut in the design of the environments, with the DNEC team dedicating significant effort to ensure that every element served a purpose. And care was taken to avoid damage, exemplified by their approach to vegetation growth. The team meticulously adjusts the density of vegetation based on factors such as moisture and light availability. The majority of the vegetation was procedurally generated using Speedtree, in addition to Houdini and Clarice that were employed for procedural scattering techniques to populate the scenes. Notably, the IV systems, masterminded by the DNAX environment supervisor Adrian Lambert, were a sophisticated and procedural setup involving multiple IVs and offering precise control over the interconnecting living and dead growth within the environment. And trust me, the result looks really cool. The rooftop of the Bostonian Museum posed one of the most challenging tasks for them, requiring the creation of an elaborate and precise representation of a specific Boston district. The team employed photogrammetry and open source data, coupled with their location photography to meticulously construct downtown Boston. In praising Weta's unmatched expertise in creature work, Craig Mazin said, nobody does creature work the way Weta does, end quote. The sentiment becomes undeniably evident when witnessing the bloater scene in episode 5, an impressive display that likely resonates with Mazin's praise. It's logical that HBO turned to Weta Effects as a lead vendor for creature work. The New Zealand-based digital visual effects company boasts an impressive track record with some of the most renowned franchises, including The Lord of the Rings, King Kong, and Avatar. Notably, the team earned an Oscar for the best visual effects for their work on Avatar The Way of the Water. VFX supervisor Simon Young and animation supervisor Dennis Yu shared insights into what a fast contribution to the HBO series, including tasks such as digitally recreating the prosthetics of the live-action bloater, in addition to generating CGI animals and transforming sets to depict overgrowth with plant life and cordyceps fungus. The company also digitally replaced live-action clickers in episode 2 and the clicker child character in episode 5. One of Fax's involvement extended to 6 out of 9 episodes, contributing to a total of 456 visual effects shots of the series with over a dozen of other VFX houses working on the show and approximately 250 visual effects shots per episode, which is impressive. The total number of shots across the entire series reached around 2,500 shots, according to Alex Wang, VFX supervisor at HBO. The Kansas City called the sex scene stands out as one of the most graphic moments in the series, featuring a grotesque mushroom-infested monster wrecking havoc. Prosthetics designer Barry Gower, known for his work on Game of Thrones and Stranger Things, crafted the look of the bloater, and stuntman Adam Basil wore the 88-pound suit made of foam rubber and foam latex, coated in a slimy lubricant to resemble fungus. While the prosthetics greatly aided the team, Young noted that the movement of the fungal pieces attached to the suit were somewhat restricted. HBO's request for a 7-foot tall creature paired with Basil's 6'4 statue led to Weta effects utilizing the power of visual effects and CGI to digitally create the bloater's prosthetics. Young explained the meticulous process of cleaning up the geometry, retexturing, and applying shaders to achieve a close match to the original look of the game. In the same scene featuring the bloater, what are facts to credit for fire facts, destruction, over 50 CG clickers emerging from the sinkholes, and the child clicker that climbs into the car with Ellie, ultimately tearing apart the antagonist Kathleen. The giraffe that Ellie feeds in another scene is a real giraffe, but one of facts played a crucial role in creating the herd and the Salt Lake City baseball field that they roam in. The team visited a zoo in Wellington to study giraffes, capturing multiple angles of reference footage and scanning them in 3D when they were still enough for the process.
Also in the second episode, I wanna mention that the team replaced certain live action clickers. Additionally, some scenes incorporated practical effects, while other features partial CG had replacements. These enhancements were implemented to achieve a more realistic appearance for the fungus prosthetics by incorporating elements such as light transmission and subsurface scattering, which is very important for realism. Generally speaking, and from what I can see, the efforts of Naughty Dog, HBO, Double Negative, and What Effects have seamlessly translated the post-apocalyptic world of The Last of Us into something believable with great realism. So if you want to watch the show, I think it is a great idea to do so. I hope you guys found this video useful and informative. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. Also, please subscribe to this channel to receive more videos like this in the future. Thank you guys very much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.